you've talked a lot, you're on record talking about the quite rapid process through which innovative tech startups become kind of grumpy, enmeshed incumbents, um, both just with the state and more generally in their business practices. Um, that topic has come up a lot recently with the Twitter files and, you know, the sort of revelations of the ways that companies um, collaborated with uh, willingly, I think, in many cases, but maybe with a looming threat as well um, with government agencies around misinformation and other questions. Um, it seems to me like we're going to be in for more of that, that this sort of blurring of the lines between public and private is our fate. Um, is that what it looks like to you? And if so, you know, is that ultimately a thing that threatens innovation or are there ways in which it could potentially speed things along? Yeah. So, you know, look, the, the textbook view of the American economy is that it's a, you know, it's a, it's a free, it's free market competition and like, you know, companies are fighting it out and, you know, different toothpaste companies are trying to sell you different toothpaste and it's a, you know, largely competitive market. And then every once in a while there's an externality that requires government intervention. And then you get, you know, these weird things like, you know, the, the too big to fail banks or whatever, but you know, those are the exceptions to the general working of the free market system. You know, look, I can tell you my experience having been now in startups for 30 years is that the opposite is true. true. Um, specifically that James Burnham was right, um, that we passed from, you know, the original model of capitalism, which he called bourgeois capitalism, which is what we still think capitalism is. We passed into a different model, which he called managerial capitalism, uh, you know, some, some decades back. Um, and the, 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 the actual correct model of how the U.S. economy works is it is mostly a process of oligopolies, cartels and monopolies. Um, and they most, it's, it's mostly them, you know, for it's basically big companies forming up in oligopolies, cartels and monopolies, um, and doing all the things that you expect oligopolies, cartels and monopolies to do. Um, and then they jointly basically corrupt and capture the regulatory and, and government process. And so they, they end up controlling their regulators. Um, and so most sectors of the economy are a conspiracy between the big incumbents and their putative regulators. Um, and the purpose of the conspiracy is to perpetuate the long-term existence of those monopolies and cartels um, and to block uh, new competition. Uh, like, so, so, so that's, where, that's where I've come out on. Um, to me, that completely explains the education system, both K through 12 and the college university system. It completely explains the healthcare system. It completely explains the housing crisis. It completely explains 2008, the financial crisis and the bailouts. Uh, it completely explains the Twitter files. Like I think that's precisely what ha what what has been happening in tech, um, and so if if you're if you're if you're if you're if you're open to that interpretation of how the world works and how the country works and how the economy works, then uh, like a lot of things start to make a tremendous amount of sense. Um, and then I, you know I think that what the Twitter files is is it's basically an X-ray of of a specific instance of that happening, um, which and, and this is just factual. What we now know from the Twitter files is that a very large number of people in government, by the way, some of them political and you know some of them like po politicians. But also some of them bureaucrats, right? Uh, and so some of the members of the right deep state, right? Which either, you know, as we know, the deep state either does not exist, or if it does exist, it's good, right? One or the other. Um, um, I, I think most people. That's what I've heard. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's what I've heard. There's a recent book on that that uh, apparently makes that case very, very clearly. Um, so let's just say like the permanent bureaucracy, uh, or, or again, what James Burnham would say is like the managerial class in government, right? The sort of permanent uh, cadre of professionals in government who basically manage everything. Um, and, you know, those people and then also people on the outside who they fund as their proxies, right, with government money, with taxpayer money, right, have been exerting enormous pressure um, on Twitter um, to block, censor, dot, 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 you know, and, and, you know, what looks to me like a straightforward constitutional case for a deprivation of constitutional rights, you know, first, fourth and fifth amendments. Um, in a way that is clearly illegal, um, both under the Constitution and under uh, is it uh, uh, Title 18, uh, whatever 242. Uh, you know, there's a specific federal law that says there it's a felon it's a felony for a government official to use the power of being in government uh, to deny citizens of constitutional rights. Um, there's actually, by the way, another law. There's 241 that actually applies that same principle to private citizens, including private companies. Um, and so I think it's possible that there has there actually I think it's possible that there's actually been criminal activity both on the government side and on the company side. Um, and yeah, and it's just like, yeah, that's been happening. And, you know, the Twitter, every new drop of the Twitter files shows that that's what's what's been happening, you know, in a in a in a non-political world where we all just like read the Constitution. Um, you know, this would be a constitutional crisis. You know, this would be the biggest story in the, in the country. There would be hearings. You know, there would be, you know, among other, you know, immediate impeachment proceedings like, you know, this this would be a five alarm fire. Because right, obviously the government can't be allowed to do this. Um, 
you know, in our, in our, in our, in the real world, of course, that's not what's happening. Um, and, you know, and we're back to either, e- either denial or, or, or embrace under the theory that this is good and proper. Right. Um, are there sectors that are less subject to that dynamic that you just described in which the startup quickly become the incumbents and the state? I mean, look, so I think it's, so my, my theory basically is, it's, it, it, the question is always the same question, like, is there actual competition, right? Like, so, so, so actually, I think there's like a deeper, my, my deeper idea here is it's basically the process of evolution. Like, so the idea of capitalism is basically an economic form of the idea of evolution, right? And natural selection and the, you know, and survival of the fittest and the idea that basically it's a superior product ought to win in the market um, and that markets ought to, ought to be open to competition and a better, you know, a new company can come along with a better widget and take out the incumbents because its widget is superior and customers like it better. And so, so like for, for evolution to proper to, to, to function properly, you need survival of the fittest, which means you need things to die when they're not the best thing. For capitalism to work properly, you need the same thing to happen. You need companies to die when they are inferior to other companies that are doing things better. Right. That that, you know, that's that that's sort of inherent to the to, to the thing. And so the, 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 qu- the question always is, like, is there actual competition happening or not? Right. Is, is, and, you know, in part is like, do consumers actually have the ability to freely select among the existing alternatives? And then the other question is like, can, can, can new, can new products actually come to market? Right. You know, can you, can you actually bring a new widget to market or do you get blocked out because the regulatory wall that's been established is, you know, basically makes that prohibitive. I mean, look, the, the great example of this is, is, is banking, right. Where, you know, the, the big thing in 2008 was we need to bail out these banks because they're quote unquote too big to fail. And so then there were screams of the need to reform the too big to fail banks that led to Dodd-Frank. The result of Dodd Frank, I call it the Big Bank Protection Act of 2011, uh, right? The, the the result of that is that the too big to fail banks are now much larger than before, um, and the number of new banks being created in the U.S. has dropped to zero, right? Because it's it's now effectively impossible to launch a new bank in the U.S. because you know J.P. Morgan Chase has 10,000 lawyers, right, working on their regulatory issues, and you have one. Like it, it's it's not possible. Like you you can't start new banks anymore. Um, and so anyway, sorry, so I'm, I'm, I'm repeating the, uh, I'm repeating the case against, um, so, but the question is like, where is that not happening? Like, you know, wh- where, where in the, where in the market is that actually not happening? Um, you know, wh- where is there free and open competition? You know, look, the, the, the cynical answer is this, it's not, that doesn't happen in the spaces that don't matter. Right. Like, so toys, like anybody can bring a new toy to market. Like it's fine. Sure. Great. Right. Anybody can. You know, I don't know, like anybody can open a restaurant, right? It's, I mean, I would say don't matter being like, you know, these are fine and good, like, you know, consumer categories that people really enjoy and so forth. But as contrasted to the healthcare system or the education system, right? Or the housing system, right? Or if the you legal. Want freedom, your What's business that? better be frivolous. If you want freedom, your business better be frivolous. I mean, that would be the, that would be the cynical way of looking at it. Like if, if, it, if it doesn't matter from a societal structure, right? In terms of like determining the power structure of society and basically the power of the government and society, um, then yeah, go crazy, do whatever you want. But like, if it actually matters to like major issues of policy, right, where the government is intertwined with them, then of course it doesn't happen there. And, and again, it doesn't happen there, not just because of the government, it doesn't happen there because of an intertwining of the incumbents in the government. You know, look, I, I think this stuff is getting, look, I, this is one of these things where I, I almost have trouble debating it. I mean, not debating it with you, but like debating it with people who argue with me on this, because I think it's so self-evident. It's like, well, why aren't there, you know, it's like, why are all these universities like identical? Like, why are all of the major universities implementing the exact same like crazy? Like, why do they all have like identical ideologies, right? Why, why isn't there like a why isn't there a marketplace of ideas at the at the university level, right? And it's like, well, th- that becomes a question of like, why aren't there more universities? Okay, well, why, uh, and I can tell you why there aren't more universities. There aren't more universities because to be a new university, you have to get accredited. Uh, the accreditation um, uh, bureau uh, is is run by the existing universities. Like it. it, it it's sitting there in plain sight. I'll give you the other another example. Why do healthcare prices do what they do, right? Why 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 do healthcare prices work the way that they work? A major reason for that um, is because um, they because basically they're they're paid for by insurance. Um, there's private insurance and public insurance. The private insurance prices just key off the public prices because Medicare basically drives the whole thing because M- Medicare is the, the big buyer. Um, so how are Medicare prices set? They're set by a unit inside HHS called CMS. Um, and, uh, and, and CMS runs literal Soviet style price fixing boards uh, for medical goods and services. Um, and so once a year, there are doctors who get together in a conference room at like a Hyatt in Chicago somewhere. Um, and they sit down and they establish, they fix, they do the exact same thing that what was the unit of uh, the, the, the Communist Party in, in, the, in, the, in Russia that used to do this in the Soviet Union. Um, there's a term for it. There was the, the Central Price Fixing Bureau, um, right? So the Soviets had a Central Price Fixing Bureau. It didn't work. <laughs> 
we don't have that for the entire economy, but we have that for the entire healthcare system, right? And it doesn't work for the same reason that the Soviet system didn't work, right? And so we've exactly replicated the Soviet system. We're expecting better results. It operates in plain sight. You can go on the med CMS. CMS has a website. They'll explain this all to you. It's operating in plain sight. Everybody thinks it's a great idea. And, and then, you know, lots of people are calling for, you know, increased government, you know, centralized, you know, control and purchasing of healthcare, which would make that system stronger. And so it's like, we, we know that this is not going to work. We know that it's going to only result in restrictions of supply and, and rising prices. We know precisely what the outcome is going to be. We seem perfectly happy with it, and then we complain about it. So, 